Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to our Monday afternoon seminar. Today it's a great pleasure to have with us Isaac Tutusaos from the University of Geneva, who will tell us about the Euclid mission. Isaac, please, you have the floor. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Savas, for, for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. I would really have loved to be here and um, able to give the seminar in person, but unfortunately, we know the situation. Although it's improving, we are still not there yet. So. We have to do it uh, on Zoom, but uh, in any case, I'm very happy to, to be here today and, <clears throat> and give this seminar on, on, on Euclid. So, as Sarah said, the idea, my idea here was to provide you with some information, kind of hopefully state-of-the-art information on what we're planning to do within Euclid for the, the, the galaxy clustering analysis using the photometric sample. And I will describe all these things, hopefully in the, in the next hour or so. So basically these are the contents, kind of, you know, the, 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 the main points that they wanna give um, during this, this seminar. So I'll start with some brief introduction. I apologize here uh, in advance uh, to, to the, the experts in the audience, because I'm gonna start quickly describing you know, the, the main information we need on, on cosmology, cosmological model, and the CDM, and these kind of things. I will then present very briefly the Euclid mission, uh, what's the aim of, of this mission, and, and quickly describe also some of the specifications that are relevant for, for the analysis that I'll be presenting afterwards. And then the, the, the talk is basically divided into different sections. So first I'll show you the, the baseline focus that we computed within the consortium for, for these uh, cosmological probes, so for photomatic galaxy clustering, which is work based on these two papers by the, by the consortium. And then I'll present several different points trying to model or to quantify and study what's the modeling that we need for this specific probe for Euclid purposes. And that's based on, well, three, here I, I quote three different papers and actually the, afterwards I'll start a few more, but this is basically a work in progress. Some of it, of it has already been published and, and some of it is still in development within the consortium. But hopefully at the end of these two parts, I'll be able to provide you with an idea of what's been done so far within the consortium for photomatic galaxy clustering. And then I'll end up with some of the challenges that uh, we are still trying to, to, to address concerning the modeling and, and the use of this probe for, for the future Euclid data. And just finish with uh, some conclusions. Okay, so we know that Lambda CDM is basically what we call the the concrete and small in cosmology. And, and it's basically because of the ability of this model to provide fits and actually also to predict different uh, cosmological data sets and, and the agreement of these predictions with, with observations. And, and it's actually quite interesting because this is a very simple model with very few parameters. So essentially six parameters. And, and we've seen that observationally the, the predictions of London CDM are in very good agreement with the observations for, for many different cosmological probes. And here I just quote some of them like type 1a supernovae, which essentially led to, to the discovery of the solid expansion through a cosmological constant. Also the baryon acoustic oscillations. So this, this excess of probability of finding galaxies at a certain distance or actually all the galaxy clustering. So basically all the large scale structure that, that uh, galaxies trace and that we can map with galaxy surveys. But not only that, so we can also go to the very early universe and, and obtain predictions from the London CDM on the cosmic microwave background, which are in very good agreement, not only with the first observations by COBE or WMAP, but also by Planck. And we can also use other cosmological probes like weak lensing, where we try to understand the, the distortions of galaxy, galaxy shapes due to this large scale structure of, of the universe. 
And actually, we, we've seen that um, different probes are usually sensitive to, to different aspects of how gravity can act in the cosmos. And if we combine these different probes, we are usually able to break quite a lot of degeneracies and therefore improve our constraints on the cosmological parameters. So basically here, just for completeness, I'm showing the, the well, these were the state of the art results in 2018, probably better now, but these are combining BAO and CMB measurements. And we can see here the six parameters of the lambda CDM model. So basically the baryon and cold dark matter densities, the, the Hubble constant, the, the amplitude and the slope of the primordial power spectrum of matter perturbations and the reionization optical depth. And we managed already 2018 with this combination of probes to get uh, better than percent measurements on all these parameters, which is very nice. So then what one could ask, okay, what's the problem with lambda CDM? And one of the problems is that um, basically given our current precision in our measurements, there are some tensions that start to appear. And I'm quite sure that most of you have already heard about such tensions. One of them being the, the tension on sigma eight. So basically this amplitude of matter fluctuations, if we compare what we glancing surveys measure and what the, the, we can infer from uh, the cosmic microwave background, assuming a lambda CDM model, it seems weak lensing measurements show us that um, sigma eight should be slightly lower than what the CMB predicts. So basically here, this is a plot from, from the latest analysis of DS year three, and you can see in green, the Planck contours for S eight, which is basically this combination of sigma eight and omega matter. And then you can see three different sets of weak lensing measurements. So we have, first of all, the DS measurements in black. Let's just forget for a second about the dashed lines here. The solid one is for the full three times two point. Then we can see in blue, the kids results, which are even lower, showing us two, three sigma tension with Planck. And then we have the, the HAC results in purple, which might be closer to, to Planck. So there seems this, there might not even be any tension at all on Sigma, but it depends quite a lot on whether you use um, Fourier space or harmonic space or ratio space to measure your, your data vector. So the idea is not to enter into the discussion here, but most of the weak lensing surveys find an amplitude of matter perturbations that's slightly lower. So it seems, there might be some new physics hidden into this tension. And then we have another tension, which is even worse than the, the previous one, which is on the Hubble constant. And we know that there are quite a lot of late time measurements, direct measurements, either using type 1A supernovae calibrated with Cepheids, which is the shoes uh, constraint, or strong lensing measurements, or even uh, using um, the tip of the red giant branch to do the calibration. And most of these measurements are significantly higher than the values we can derive from Planck or from uh, DS, for example, using some prior on the big band nuclear synthesis. So there is a tension that uh, changes depending on the measurements that you consider. It's basically very close to five sigma, also using the latest constraints from, from the Schuss uh, team. And not only that, so we know that lambda CDM, okay, can predict very well many cosmological observations, which is great. It's a very simple model, which is also great, but there are some tensions at the start to appear. And it's also important to keep in mind that the nature of basically 95% of what's in the universe is still known. So everything being dark matter or dark energy, we still don't really know what they are. So what's clear is that we need first more precise measurements on both the expansion of the universe and, and the large scale structure in order to test different models beyond lambda CDM. And I know that many of you are working on, the, on these kind of extended models or theory, theoretical models that try to, to provide some new light on, on the dark components of the universe beyond just colder matter and, and, and cosmological constant. 
so basically we need better measurements to test these models and um, here I'm just quoting the simplest example one, one could think of because I'm going to use this in the following which is to consider a dark energy fluid based on a cosmological constant just simply parameterize as, a, as a, an ideal fluid with an equation of state given by this expression. So we basically have W0 and WA providing the value of the, the, the equation state of this fluid today and its evolution as a function of redshift. And I'm gonna use this because this is one of the main statistics. Well, basically the constraints on these quantities are gonna be one of the main statistics we're gonna use in the following in order to study the constraining power of Euclid. So there are basically many different ways to make these observations, but one of the best ways is to use uh, galaxy surveys. So galaxy surveys can provide very precise measurements on both the expansion and the large scale structure, and therefore they can be very useful to test different uh, extended models. And one of these uh, future galaxy surveys that will soon provide us very, very precise information is, is the Euclid satellite. And here we can see this nice artist uh, view of, of the, the spacecraft, which is actually now essentially built. And it's expected to launch in, um, yeah, April, May, 2023. So in general for future galaxy surveys, also actually for, for current surveys, but especially for future surveys, there are three main cosmological probes that we can identify. So one thing we can do is we can use spectroscopic information in order to determine the, the, the redshift of the, of the galaxies spectroscopically. And this basically allows us to place galaxies in this three-dimensional large-scale structure space. So we can see the, all these filaments, all these voids, all these clusters, and therefore we can basically measure this galaxy clustering and be sensitive not only to the position of galaxies but also to the peculiar velocities. So this is basically the standard analysis of spectroscopic galaxy clustering, like it's done with uh, SDSS, BOS, EBOS, and, and now DESI. But we can also use photometric techniques to measure the shape of galaxies. And we can basically try to understand well, what are the changes on the shapes of these galaxies due to the, the propagation of, of photons through the, the, the large scale structure. So in this case, with this weak lensing cosmic shear measurements, we are rather sensitive to, to the total matter distribution to this integrated matter distribution. And therefore it's closer to being like a two dimensional probe instead of a three dimensional one. And if we still use these photometric uh, observations of galaxies, we can still infer part of the radial information. So we can still extract some photometric redshifts. And therefore, even if we lose quite a lot of information, radially speaking, we can still place galaxies in a two dimensional space and perform some galaxy clustering measurements. So basically this is what in comparison with the, with the spectroscopic case, this is what one would see with these photometric uh, redshifts. Just a small caveat. So here, this is a simulation for, for the power survey. And you can see that the delta Z is 0.003, which is much smaller than the current position and, and even the future position for photometric surveys. But this is just in order to be able to see something in the mock. I mean, if we really apply the photomatic uncertainty that we expect, it was much harder to see any, any structure at all in the radial direction. But the thing is that we can still use this photomatic information to perform galaxy clustering measurements. But this is somewhat a, a, a newer probe in the sense that um, between the last years that we've started to consistently add this probe into cosmological analysis, but before we cosmological constraints were essentially given either by spectroscopic clustering or by weak lensing. And the important thing is that these three probes will actually probe the same volume, at least in the case of Euclid. So in principle, these probes 
can also be correlated. They are not actually, actually they're not independent. So there are also some cross correlations that need to be taken into account. And I will talk also a little bit about some of them, in particular, these ones between photomatic clustering and, and weak lensing. So is that a question yep. so of the three probes, yep. which one mm -hmm. is the, let's say the strongest one, which gives the best constraints? If that's yeah that that's a very tricky question and it depends quite a lot on the choice on the modeling choices of of them so basically depending on the model and depending on the parameters so for instance if you're looking at the total matter contribution or at the amplitude of matter fluctuations usually it's weak lensing that can provide the, the tightest constraints if you look at the quantity of baryons for example usually it's a spectroscopic clustering because you really need to recover the BAO, the BAO wiggles, you need to be able to probe them in order to put constraints on omega baryon. Um, that's why we want to combine actually them because usually they are sensitive to different parameters and, and the combination provides the tightest constraint. But then there is also a lot of discussion on the scales that you put into the, the analysis. So basically, depending on, on our ability to model our predictions for the different probes, we can push to smaller scales and therefore extract more information. So depending on how optimistic or conservative we are in each one of the probes, it depends. Uh, it might depend which one is the, yeah. is the most powerful one, let's say. OK, thanks. Uh, there is a question by Juan. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Isaac. I have another question Hello. now that you open the floor, which is uh, comparing the spectroscopically to the photometric part of the survey, of the Euclid survey, um, what fraction uh, what advantage there is in the photometric one, given that we have mm -hmm. this uncertainty in photo C, in, in terms of numbers, I imagine you can see orders of magnitude more galaxies in photometry than spectroscopically, because you have to follow the, the, the sleet spectroscopy on those lines, right? So how much do you gain with one with respect to the other? If you want to put the two in, on the same footing, which one would you uh, prefer in terms of uh, errors? Or are they complementary? So, the, yeah, actually they are complementary. And I'm going to show you this in, in not right now, but in, in a few slides. Um, they are not exactly sensitive. So, so basically the degeneracies that we can see in different parameters using these two different probes are not exactly the same. So when we combine them, there is something to gain. Then um, as, as, a, as a standalone probe, Obviously, it's much more powerful to use the spectroscopic one because we also have all the Redshift space distortions information, which we don't in the photometric case. Mm -hmm. But um, um, in terms of number density, I think there is like uh, two orders of magnitude more objects in the photometric sample, which makes this probe quite useful at the end. So if I were to choose one, uh, yeah, it's it's a bit tricky. I mean, I, I would choose both, <laughs> but they are yeah they are quite complementary at the end. I mean, it's not repeated information, and also it's important to keep in mind. And and I also talk about this that for the spectrum uh, spectroscopic case in Euclid, we are limited in redshift range, so we'll only have information from 0.9 to 1.8, whereas mm -hmm. in the photometric case, we'll have uh, the same range than, than for weak lensing. So basically, everything up to redshift 2.5 or so. But, but yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Okay, another another comment. Since I see mm -hmm. in this slide the the power survey, and uh, we pretend to reach uh, three per mil, that's clearly not the situation with Euclid. Uh, I don't think we can get better than five percent in photo C one plus C. No. So uh, how much? Uh, um, well, how bad uh, can it get uh, by reducing the error in photo C that much by an order of magnitude? Can you really uh, be able to, to take advantage of the photometry from Euclid? Yes, yes, actually we can. And here I just put this, this value, you know, in order to be able to see something from, from this, this simulation. But actually in all focus, the, the most, let's say, optimistic case that we use in Euclid is 0.05. Mm -hmm. So basically all the constraints we get are already assuming that we cannot do better than 0.05 because probably we won't. Unless you know we select very specific types of objects that we know we can calibrate somehow, mm -hmm. but um, all the all the constraints that I'm going to show you in, in the following are assuming a 
at least uh, an uncertainty of 0.05. So even with, let's say, quote unquote, realistic uh, photo depreciation, we'll be able to do to, to extract information from that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I want to stop you. Thanks. No, no. Please feel free to 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 ask any questions you may have at any time. Um, okay. So let me. Yeah. This is basically again about Euclid. So for those, who, uh, probably you already know, but in any case, Euclid will have two different surveys. So we have a photometric and a spectroscopic survey. Basically, the spectroscopic will provide something like five times 10 to the seven galaxies in this redshift range, as we were saying before. And for the weak lensing, we'll have many more galaxies in all the redshift range from essentially zero up to 2.5. So the thing is that since we have, we're going to have the position of these galaxies. We can also do photometric galaxy clustering with these uh, photo, uh, photometrically observed galaxies. Although in practice, there might be some problems to use all of these galaxies and I'll describe them uh, at, the end, at the end of the talk. Okay, and I just wanted to show you this beautiful plot, which is basically showing the one of the latest, let's say, um, observing plan of, of the, the Euclid satellite. So the thing is here, it's uh, we can see basically Euclid will observe everything which is not uh, in, in, the, in the galactic plane, nor in the zodiacal plane. And each one of these colors basically concerns one year of observations. So here in these dashed lines, we can see the regions where we're gonna have the highest signal to noise because the sky is, is the darkest. All these black things are stars that, that won't be observed. And uh, you can see also here, we're gonna have in Euclid something called the deep fields, which we will go like two magnitudes deeper and that are very important for spectroscopic clustering. But for photometric clustering, we'll rather focus on the wide survey, which is the, these 15,000 square degrees that we can see in this, in this image. Okay, so the thing is that Euclid will be able to probe scales and redshift that right now we cannot access. So we will be able to go to redshift 2.5 or even more, who knows, and to very small scales with a lot of resolution. But in order to use the information that's hidden in these regimes, we need a modeling for all our observables that that's accurate enough so that we don't bias our cosmological results. So basically there are two questions that we can ask ourselves. So the first thing is, okay, can we actually extract something from this photomatic galaxy clustering? And the thing is that the observations are essentially there for free. Again, quote unquote, it's not exactly true, but for weak lensing, we need to measure where the galaxies are. And um, basically we can already use that information and see where we can do something with that. And then the second question is, okay, if we can extract some useful information, how accurately we need to model this, uh, this probe, this, this additional observable for, for Euclid. So this is basically two questions that we're trying to answer right now in the consortium. And hopefully with uh, the, the results that I'll show you in the following, we'll be able at least to, to answer one of them and, and half of, of the other. Okay, so first of all, this is the, let's say after the introduction, this is the first big part of my talk. So what are the baseline focus for Euclid, but focusing on this probe. So the thing is that we need uh, this paper a couple of years ago, uh, this collaboration paper, where we basically produce official focus for, for all Euclid main probes. And we did that just recapping. Uh, I mean, the idea here was, okay, there are two questions that we want to answer. So the first one is whether we can extract some useful information or not from photometric galaxy clustering in the case of Euclid, because this is some information that it's it's there almost for free in the sense that when we do our weak lensing measurements, we already have the position of galaxies and, and the photometric relatives. So the idea is to see whether we can extract some, some information from these measurements that are there. Mm -hmm. And then the second question is, okay, assuming we can, assuming there is something to gain from these uh, measurements, how accurately we need to model this probe so that we can use it for, for Euclid. So 
this is the first like big part of, of the talk where I'm going to present the, the baseline focus that we did in the consortium for, for photomatic clustering. So a few a couple of years ago, we did this collaboration paper where we basically took several independent codes. So we compared all of them and we provided the official focus of the consortium for all the main Euclid probes, in particular the photomatic galaxy clustering. So today I'm just going to focus on this one. We did uh, some fisher matrix focus, although these were validated against some just Monte Carlo focus. And the, the, the main ingredients are the true redshift distribution. So basically we need a true underlying redshift distribution for all the, the galaxies that will be detected in this photomatic sample. And we use this typical uh, smale distribution where we have the power law and exponential cutoff. But since it's a photomatic survey, we are not really going to measure this, this underlying distribution. So we basically convolved the distribution with two different Gaussian distributions uh, in order to get the photomatic redshifts. And basically, the convolution was done with this expression. So basically, we have here one Gaussian distribution, which is for the, the baseline objects, if you, if you want. So well-behaved, let's say, photomatic objects. And this is a second Gaussian for, for the outliers. So there's a fraction of outliers for which we bias actually the redshift determination. And then with these two, we basically convolve the true underlying distribution to get something like this. So this is basically the, the 10 tomographic bins that we use in the baseline focus for the photomatic uh, sample. So there's something important. And here is that we assume each one of these distributions to be perfectly known. Okay, so this is raw optimistic. So we are neglecting some significant systematic effects here, but I'll talk a bit more about this afterwards. So the idea is that once we convolve with the photosynthesis and, and we introduce this broadening of the, of the distribution, we assume that we perfectly know this distribution. And then, we basically took 10 tomographic bins between redshift 0 and 2.5 with the constant number of galaxies per tomographic bin, which is basically 30 galaxies per arc minute squared. And not only we took the, 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 the autocorrelation for each one of the bins, but also all the cross correlations between different redshift bins, uh, because there's some significant overlap. And actually we can extract some information from these cross correlations. Okay, so <clears throat> the next ingredients for the focus are basically the observable. So we just use the angular power spectrum. So we convolved the, the nonlinear matter power spectrum with these two window functions in order to get the angular one. And the window functions for galaxy clustering are essentially given by the galaxy bias times the number density. So the, the distribution of galaxies. And in this case, we assume a fiducial bias given by the square root of one plus z, where z is the mean value in each one of the tomographic bins. And the Gaussian covariance. So basically, this is the, the, the baseline focus, and we've been studying each one of these assumptions, but these were the, the first, let's say, official results that, that we, we claimed within the consortium. And actually, this is. Probably this is my answer once um, question before, because here I'm showing you the different probes, the main Euclid probes, the constraints on the equation of state parameters of dark energy, as well as the constraints on omega matter and sigma A. So in, in blue here, you can see the weak lensing contours in purple, the spectroscopic clustering ones in orange, the, the standard combination of weak lensing and spectroscopic clustering, which is what one would do in order to benefit from, from these different sensitivity, sensitivities of the probes. And in yellow is the same combination, but when we add photomatic clustering, and we also take into account the cross correlations between photomatic clustering and weak lensing, which is also called galaxy galaxy lensing. So just to provide some numbers, if you look at this, basically the figure of merit 
which is related to the area of this contour goes from 150 to basically close to 1300 for the full combination. So this is like a factor of eight improvement when we add photometric clustering and galaxy galaxy lensing. I, I think there is a raised hand or maybe not. Yes, yes, there I, is. Uh, yeah. Sorry to, to bother you again. So the assumption in the previous slide that the bias yep. goes like the square root of one plus C, which is something very mm -hmm. specific, I imagine this is for, say, most of the uh, field galaxies, but uh, is this going to affect your results? How much are you dependent on this particular ansatz for the bias? Because in, in DS, and we cover a similar range in redshift, we don't find that the bias goes like square root of one plus C. Actually, it goes much deeper mm -hmm. in, in redshift. So yep. is there any particular reason why we, you chose this? Yeah, so um, the original motivation <laughs> was that in, in, in the first focus for Euclid coming from the Red Book, like in 2011 or so, this was the fiducial used and, and we, we decided to use the same fiducial. But we did indeed check, and actually for some of the results that I'll show you in the following, we use a different bias measure on simulations. And that actually we checked was in agreement with some real measurements from the HSC and the bias indeed is quite different. It increases much faster than this than this expression, but we did not see any significant changes on the uncertainties for the cosmological parameters. So basically, even if we assume a different bias form, we saw that these contours were quite stable. So basically, uh, we, since we were not looking at shifts in the best fit, but just at the size of the uncertainties, these do not depend on the fiducial use for the galaxy bias, as long as you use the same kind of parameterization. So basically what we did was a constant bias per tomographic bin. So when we use a different fiducial, but still allow for a constant bias per tomographic bin, the cosmological constraints were the same. Obviously, if we reduce the number of bins because we decided to use a different parameterization, then there, there was more constraining power because there were less nuisance parameters to constrain and therefore the constraints would change. But with the same parameterization, different fiducials, this was not affecting the results. Great, thank you very much. You answered my question. Yeah, yeah no problem. So, um, yeah. So basically there is some information to be gained from photomatic clustering and in this particular case, the, the, the contribution from galaxy galaxy lensing. And not only on these parameters, but also on, on others. So here I'm just showing this for, 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 for visualization, but actually we have all these huge triangular plots with all the parameters and we can see some improvement in, in all of them. There's also something important. We can see two different settings and this is related to Sabah's question at the very beginning, which one of these probes is, is more powerful. Here we can see that for these two parameters, Spectroscopic clustering and weak lensing are more or less the same, but if you look at sigma eight, weak lensing is significantly more powerful than spectroscopic clustering. But this also depends on the scales that are added into the analysis for each one of these probes. So basically, here we defined an optimistic settings where we went to multiples of five thousand for weak lensing and three thousand for for the other photometric probes, so photometric clustering and galaxy galaxy lensing, and some pessimistic settings going down to 1500 and 750. And I'll refer to this in the following because depending on what effects are we looking at, sometimes we can see the optimistic or the pessimistic settings. Okay. And actually I just wanted to, to quickly mention not on, but also the, the role of this uh, photomatic clustering, but also the role of galaxy galaxy lensing. So the role of this cross correlation between photomatic clustering and weak lensing. So basically here, we can just directly zoom into these two parameters for the equation of a state of dark energy. And in blue, you can see the combination of galaxy clustering and weak lensing, assuming they are independent, which we know they are not because we're using the same galaxies for these uh, probes. And in red, what happens when we add galaxy galaxy lensing into the data vector? So we add this additional information and we take the full covariance into account and we can see a significant improvement. So that's basically, I mean, this is just showing somehow the the, so, the, the well-known three times two point now that it's so used in DS. So here we are showing again that 
this is going to be critical for, for Euclid. We really need to profit from this and not just use spectroscopic clustering and weak lensing. And actually we went even beyond that and we considered not only the cosmological parameters, but also systematic effects. So we considered the galaxy bias, for example, not only different fiducials, but we also look at different models for galaxy bias, even going beyond linear galaxy bias. And we saw that cross collations are actually helpful in improving the constraints on these parameters because basically galaxy clustering will have a lot of problems to constrain the galaxy bias but the weak lensing is not sensitive to it so basically the combination can help us in constraining these nuisance parameters and the same for intrinsic alignments which are one of the most important systematic effects for weak lensing but not for galaxy clustering so here basically again in orange, you can see the combination of clustering weak lensing, and in green, the same combination, but adding galaxy galaxy lensing in this joint coherent three times two point analysis. And then you can see, well, these three parameters, in order not to enter into the details, this just parametrize these intrinsic alignment effects. And you can see that actually there's a lot of information to be, to be gained from, from this joint analysis. Okay, so hopefully we've answered the first question. So how important is the information we can extract? And actually it's very important. It's true the photometric clustering alone, I haven't showed the contours for that. The contours are not impressive. So we lose a lot of relative information due to the photo Z's. And therefore, if we compare photometric clustering alone against spectroscopic clustering, um, yeah, the probe is less constraining. But when we combine this with weak lensing together with galaxy galaxy lensing, this can boost significantly Euclid's precision, actually by a factor of eight, something like that. And actually we need this, we show that we need this to reach Euclid's objectives, which is to know the, the equation of state of dark energy at the level of 1%. So then we can basically ask ourselves the second question. Okay, so now that we know that with this baseline focus, with all the caveats and all the assumptions, uh, we need this probe. How well we need to model photomatic clustering in order to, to be able to use it for the future Euclid data. And this is basically the second part of the talk. And we did many different things. So the first one is, okay, you might remember at the very beginning I said, we assume the N of Z to be perfectly known, even when we add these photo Z uncertainties, that basically will provide broader distributions, we still assume that we perfectly knew those. And we know this is not gonna be the case. And we basically did what's done in current uh, surveys where we allow basically a shift in the mean of the distribution. So basically we assume we perfectly know the distribution but we allow it to shift a little bit. And what we can see is that we need very tight priors in the case of Euclid, if we do not want to degrade our constraining power too much. And this is basically what we can see in this busy plot. So let's just forget about the dashed lines, which are for the pessimistic. Let's just pick the solid lines, which are the optimistic case. And if you look at galaxy clustering, for example, this is how much the figure of merit will degrade depending on the prior that we put on these shifts. So basically, if we put like a super tight prior, we can see that we can recover the figure of mate, like if we perfectly knew the distribution. But if our priors are less stringent, there's gonna be a significant degradation. And we showed that actually we need very, very tight priors in this case for the green lines, which are the full three times two point, in order not to degrade our constraints by more than, than 10 or 20%. Yes, Juan? It's probably a worth pointing out here. A, our experience is that it's not just the width. I, I imagine you're assuming a Gaussian distribution for the photo Z. It's not just the width, but the actual a, a skewness of these distributions in, in photo Z. Typically, they have very long tails, especially at higher Z. And we note that it decreates a lot, the amount of information. The fact that you have these long non-Gaussian tails. Have you explored these features? And how do they degrade your ability to your fewer Yes, um, yeah, indeed, you're totally right. We know that actually with, with the mean, 
it might be enough for with lensing. Not clear that it will be enough for Euclid, but it might be. But for galaxy clustering, we are even more sensitive to the shape of the N of Z. And getting the shape wrong will, will have a significant bias on the posteriors, which we, we, we don't want. So um, we haven't started yet on adding systematic uncertainties on the shape of the distribution. So this is something that I'll, I'll mention in the future challenges. So for the moment, we are going beyond Gaussian in the sense that we are generating photometric redshifts on simulations and measuring the distributions in simulations with all these non-Gaussian shapes. But still, in terms of the modeling, we are not accounting for systematic effects beyond a uh, shift in the mean. But we, we are planning to, to, to look into that hopefully sooner rather than later, because we know that this can also uh, significantly impact the, the results. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Very mm -hmm. significantly in our experience. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally, totally agree. Um, okay, so, and also just to, to go back again to the correlations, we also saw that actually, when we combine in this full three times two point analysis, galaxy galaxy lensing can actually help in constraining these shifts, these nuisance parameters. And basically, here we can see that there is a factor close to three improvement on the uncertainties of these nuisance parameters. So, again, motivating the fact that if we add this additional information, we can also help mitigating some of the systematic effects that would be present in weak lensing analysis, for instance. Okay, so that was something we did, just you know, to add some simple systematics to see how these degrade the uncertainties. But then there is something slightly more towards optimization that, that we also did. So basically one could ask oneself, uh, okay, is it better to use less galaxies with very precise for disease or just use more galaxies with obviously worse for disease? And this is something close to, to this uh, two different lens samples that were used in the SY3. So we had basically red magic with uh, 2.6 million objects with very nice photometric redshift uncertainties. And then we had the Maglim sample, which was just a magnitude limited sample with 10.7 million objects with slightly worse photometric redshifts, as we can see here, the distributions are slightly broader. So the question is, should we go for one or the other? And, and then we try to, to answer this quantity, quantitatively for, for Euclid. So basically the first thing we did was to generate some photometric redshifts. And here I'm just gonna skip the details because I see I'm running a bit, a bit out, uh, out of time, but um, just to make it sure, Euclid will not have optical bands. So basically Euclid will only have a very broad band, the, the B's band, covering most of the optical uh, regime, and then three bands in the near infrared. So we basically will, will need optical bands from the ground in order to build our photometric redshifts. And this is what we did here. So we basically generated four different photometric uh, qualities depending on different assumptions. So basically here, these magnitude cuts are for something close to Rubin. And these ones are for something close to DS. So basically we go from very opti quite optimistic to, to something like what we have right now with uh, photometric surveys. And then there is also the training. So basically there are different ways we could do the training in order to generate photosis with a training uh, based method. This yellow line here is basically the, the fraction of objects that we have now uh, from spectroscopic uh, redshift uh, surveys. And that's usually used in, in current analysis to train the photometric uh, redshift codes. And this black line here is our uh, assumption that basically we'll manage to get spectra for, for all objects down to a magnitude of 21 or so in the Bs band, and then we'll lack fainter objects, we we'll, we'll lack a fraction of objects at fainter magnitudes. And this is basically 
more or less the expectation for when Euclid data is, is available. So basically combining this photometry and, and the different training samples, we generated six different cases for photometric redshifts, which are the ones that you can see here. So basically we took DNF, this training-based algorithm to, to estimate photometric redshifts, and we assigned photometric redshifts to all the objects in the flagship simulation. And here, basically, you can see the photometric redshift in the y-axis as a function of the true redshift. So basically, here would be for photometry ground-based data close to, to what DS is providing. And this one here would be something close to, to what Rubin will hopefully provide for, for Euclid. And as you can see, there are two different uh, estimates for the photometric redshift that come out of DNF. We have Z mean, which is basically the average of the redshift, all of the redshift uh, from the neighborhood in the training. And then we have a ZMC, which is just a Monte Carlo draw from, from the nearest neighbor. So basically what we did here was we took one of these estimates, basically Z mean, we bin the galaxies in tomographic bins, and then we did the stacking of the other estimate, in this case ZMC, to get the distribution. So basically this is, for example, the, the, the fiducial distribution we consider for Euclid from the flagship simulation with these photo Zs that we generated. And then we did two different things. So one was to study the number and the type of tomographic bins. So in the baseline that I showed you, we used 10 tomographic bins with uh, the same number of galaxies per bin just for historical reasons. And in this work, we wanted to basically understand whether there's something to gain going beyond 10 or not. And here you can see the figure of merit with respect to some reference as a function of the number of bins. So basically in, in solid, you can see how the figure of merit increases as a function of the number of bins for photomatic clustering. And in dash lines is the combination with galaxy galaxy lensing. So this kind of plateau is expected because once we have too many beams, we are reaching the, the uncertainty of the photo Z. So there's not, there isn't any more information that can be obtained. One could ask, why is this, uh, the combination kind of flattening before the, the, the single probes, so the case for photomatic clustering alone? And this is just because the systematic effects that were considered. So here for photomatic clustering, the bias was fixed because if not, it was very degenerate with the amplitude of matter perturbations. And that's why it might seem that actually we could gain even more by going to more than 30 bins and using like 20. But once you start having some systematic effects, th there's gonna be this plateau showing, telling you that there is no point in going beyond um, a certain number of bins. And this will essentially just increase the size of your data vector, your covariance, and make the analysis more complicated. But in any case, we show that there was something to be gained from going, going from 10 to, to 13 bins or slightly more. And we also studied what happens in terms of number density and photo disease quality. So we know that the ideal thing would be to have like the best possible photo disease with the highest number density, and this should provide the best possible constraints. But here we, we explore what happens for these six different uh, photos qualities that we considered, going from, from less quality to, to, to a very optimistic scenario. And also we can see what happens when we limit the number density using different cuts in magnitude. So just picking the, the, the brightest galaxies or adding fainter and fainter galaxies as we go up in the y-axis. And we find something interesting. We found something interesting and this is for photometric clustering. And there is a, a small caveat here. So for our training, we assume we would only have training information down to a magnitude of 24.5. And the reason for that is that because we are quite convinced we won't have many spectroscopic redshift at magnitudes, magnitudes of 25 or so in the B-span. So basically we went even beyond what our training sample was prepared to, 
to see whether it would make sense to add galaxies, even if we know that we cannot properly compute the photometric redshifts. And what we saw for the photometric clustering case is that it's better not to. So basically here you can see that we, we are very close to yellow, which is uh, in this normalized figure of merit is the maximum. And then we go back to green. So we decrease our constraining power, even for a fixed photos equality, when we add more galaxies. And this might seem counterintuitive, but the thing is that these galaxies that we are adding, they are just noise. So they are diluting our N of Zs, and therefore we are losing constraining power from photomatic clustering. So this basically tells you that in the case of photomatic clustering, it's better to add as many galaxies as possible, as long as you can properly train the, the photomatic uh, code and therefore extract reliable photometric redshifts. But the situation is different when you combine with galaxy galaxy lensing because galaxy galaxy lensing is sensitive at least partially to the integrated uh, integrating along the line of sight, at least one of the kernels. And therefore, in this case, it's, it's more useful to have more galaxies, even if we don't really know where they are. And that's why we can still improve when adding galaxies for which we don't know how to compute or how to estimate the photomatic redshift or, or better said for galaxies for which we are extrapolating our photomatic uh, redshift estimation. So basically from this first optimization that we did for the photomatic sample, we show that um, beans with the same size in redshift provide a slightly higher figure of merit than beans with the uh, same number of galaxies uh, per bin. There is something to be gained going beyond tantomorphic beans, but this will also depend on our ability to model all the systematic effects. And it's important to be cautious when we add thin galaxies for photomatic clustering, since we might be losing constraining power. So we might just prefer to select less galaxies with more reliable redshifts. And it also depends on whether we're looking at galaxy clustering alone or the combination with galaxy galaxy lensing. Okay, um, how, how much longer do I have? Maybe two, three minutes, five minutes. Two, two three minutes, you said? So yeah, two, three minutes to five minutes. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, so. Unfortunately, I'm gonna skip all this bit because if not, I won't have time, but I would be very happy to talk about this more in detail if someone wants to. So basically we look at uh, the modeling for photomatic clustering, not only including the density contribution, which is what we did in the baseline focus, but also looking at the magnification effects because we're observing galaxies in the past light cone. We also look at redshift space distortions. So I'm gonna skip this. Another thing we did is we went beyond a Gaussian covariance. So we introduced a super sample covariance modeling. And we saw that basically the, the constraints are degraded by a factor of uh, by 50%. So basically this is the figure of merit that you can get from the three times two point analysis of Euclid. And you basically divide it by two when you introduce the super sample covariance and setting the same scales. So this is something important to keep in mind because the super sample covariance is very relevant for, for Euclid. I'm gonna skip this. And then the future challenges. So there are many other things that we need to understand like the matter modeling. So here I'm just showing different predictions for the, the matter power spectrum. And this is just allowing, you know, the, the values to change around five sigma, the constraints from Planck. And you can see that depending if we use gauge encode or just halo fit, there are differences that can go at 10% already at scales of K equal, equal one. So this basically tells you that we need to be able to, to properly understand all this modeling if we want to use it for photomatic clustering. This is just an example for, for Planck and Euclid weed lensing. But here, for example, you can see the type of biases that we can get if we do the analysis with one model while the data vector was generated using a different model. So it's also very important to, to, to do this study for photomatic clustering. And this is something we are working on. 
the same happens or the same applies for baryonic effects. So basically here you can see, again, we generated some uh, synthetic data vector with our baryonic effects in green, which is in perfect agreement, obviously, with these dashed lines. And then we did some analysis, in this case, for Planck and Euclid weak lensing, using different models for the baryonic correction. So again, the biases are very important, several sigma, and we need to understand these for photomatic clustering. And there are also other effects that we're looking into. So what happens with nonlinear galaxy bias? We've started to look into this, but we need to do it uh, a more detailed analysis, basically to make it consistent also with the modeling of spectroscopic clustering, in particular, if you wanna combine the two clusterings at the end. We also need to, to better understand how to model Ratchet space distortions. Naively, one could think that for photometric surveys, since we are kind of smoothing along the line of sight, Ratchet space distortions are not important, but some works show that if neglected, they can bias your results. So we are also working into this, looking into this. Photometric redshifts, we started to, to do some kind of optimization, but as we were saying before, we need to account for uncertainties on the full shape of the N of Z, not just the mean. We also need to account for the fact that Euclid will use ground-based data from different surveys with different systematic effects. So our data from the ground will not be homogeneous. And we're also looking onto what happens when we consider all the systematic effects like spurious clustering because of the Milky Way or, or the fact that we have different depths in different regions of the sky. And all this is, is work in progress. So just to conclude, we know that uh, we can use photomatic clustering uh, to, to, to run some galaxy clustering analysis. It's been shown with real data like DS, and we show with our focus for Euclid that um, it's also important. We actually even went beyond that, and we show that we really need this probe together with the cross correlations to actually manage to achieve the, the desired constraints from, from Euclid data. And there is quite a significant effort within the consortium right now to be able to use this probe for, for the future analysis. So basically we did a baseline analysis to, to quantify the role of photomatic clustering. We've started to work on, on an optimization of the sample for this type of analysis. We are looking at the, the modeling that's required. So basically how to implement magnification, how to account for edge space distortions, how to use nonlinear galaxy bias if we want to push to small scales. And we know there's something, other effects that we need to take into account, like how to go beyond limber, how to properly model all those, all this nonlinear matter paraspectra down to very small scales, how to include baryonic effects or marginalize over the, the uncertainties on the modeling, and also other systematic effects more related to observations. And at the end, the idea is to be able to, to have a sufficiently mature knowledge of these probes so that we can combine these with the other main probes of Euclid and, and do this full six times two points analysis with the data that will hopefully come in, in the next years. And uh, yeah, I'm just gonna stop there. And, and thanks thanks for you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Zach, for this very exciting talk. So. Uh, we have time for one or two quick questions. I, I have a, a small question. You, you mentioned uh, intrinsic alignments before. Uh, is there a possibility to measure those rather than uh, capturing their effect as a systematic effect? Can we really go and measure like we, we are trying with PAU? Yeah. I think Euclid will, will, be, will have enough information to, to measure the contribution from intrinsic alignments and extract physics mm. from it. Yeah, that's that's that that could be that would be really interesting. I think I mean I'm a bit afraid that we probably won't, at least not in all the redshift range that we need to cover for, for cosmic shear analysis, in the sense that we've been able to do some measurements at low redshift with current uh, surveys, specifically mm -hmm. or, or partially designed to do that. But to, to extrapolate the so basically to do the measurements at redshift two. That's that's going to be really, really. really well, hard, I think that's I think. really challenging. No, I was thinking more low yes. redshift, you no, know, uh, up to redshift one at most, where the photometry uh, will be uh, crucial. 
because you don't have a spectroscopy there, essentially, with Euclid. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't know. I think this is a very interesting question. Actually, I don't know whether people are looking into this within the consortium. So we're definitely looking into how to just, you know, mitigate the uncertainty using different models and how not to bias or cosmological parameters. Sure. That's treating as but, a systematic, uh, but I want to take it as exactly. a survey. Yeah, I think yeah, I think that would be that would be really really nice. For the moment, I'm not aware of any work looking into this within the consortium. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, the better we can measure this type of things, the less freedom we have to leave for them as a systematic, and the the most constraining power we can we can keep right. So so that's that that's indeed going to be key. I mean, if we can really measure. Or even if not measuring, put some informative priors mm -hmm. that we know that won't bias uh, our posteriors, but can allow us to keep some some of the constraining information. If not, we might just be pushing to smaller scales and use the the, the additional information to constrain the nuisance parameters, which wouldn't be that <laughs> wouldn't be that nice. So indeed, I think that any possibility there might be to measure things and and use this information for informative priors, that, that should be definitely done. But for intrinsic alignment case, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know whether people are looking into that right now or not. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I have to go. I have another telecom, but very interesting talk. Thank you, Isaac. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. Okay, any more questions, Santi? Uh, yes, so yeah, thanks for the talk. So I was wondering, um, I think the plot you were showing about the forecast uh, on WAW or not, uh, that assumes uh, that they're independent probes, so there's no co covariance between probes. Is that correct? Or So you're referring to this plot, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. This one is maybe newer than the... Yeah, I was referring to an older one, but maybe this is a new paper. I don't know. So this is... Yeah, this kind of plot. So this, you, are you yeah. assuming that they're independent probes or? So for, for the blue contour here, yes. So the blue contour is just, you know, you, you put your, your galaxy CLs and your cosmic shear CLs into the data vector. You, you run each one of the probes independently and then you just combine. The red one, no. The red one is the full three times two point like in DS. So you would basically have your galaxy CLs, your galaxy galaxy lensing, and your cosmic shear, all of them into a single data vector, and then a full covariance taking into account all the cross uh, correlations between the probes. So the, okay. the, the red one is the is the full three times two point. And for the spectroscopic case, because there was also one plot where- the... Yeah, no, in, in there, we like this one. So here we indeed assume that spectroscopic clustering is independent from all the others. Mm. So in the optimistic case, that's, yeah, I mean, it's not completely clear that we can do that. It's true that the spectroscopic clustering is at much higher redshift. So it starts at redshift one, essentially. Most of the information from the photometric probes will come from lower redshift. So they should not be super correlated, but still part of the volume is the same. In the pessimistic scenario that I'm not showing you the, the plots here, but in the pessimistic case, what we did was we applied a hard cut for the photometric uh, probes. Well, for galaxy clustering, galaxy, galaxy lensing. So we only consider that redshift 0.9. And mm -hmm. then we combine with spectroscopic clustering. So in that case, there is no correlation because the, we actually just remove the data from the data vector. But you lose a lot of constraining power by doing that. So there is, this is something that we are looking into and, and definitely needs to be properly known by the time the data is, is there. How to probably combine these three-dimensional probe with the two-dimensional ones, taking into account the correlation and, and doing a joint analysis. Because if not, we'll, we'll be forced to, to just... Yeah, yeah because I was uh, surprised when you combine them that the, the, the size of the... Of the error releases a lot, so I don't know how much, you know, uh, you know, because the, the size yeah. of the individual errors is still large, but then when you combine them, it's reduced a lot. So I, yeah, yeah, but I mean, I know that this is very difficult to, to do at the moment. Uh, so yeah, 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 uh, no, no, but but you're totally right. I mean, these are focus, and we are you know testing different settings, and that's kind of okay. But for real data, 
we need to have a proper covariance, which might also be tricky because usually for these photometric probes, we usually use a, a theory covariance. Well, for the spectroscopic one, we use a mock covariance. So how to build a single joint covariant is something also not completely straightforward, but that needs to be addressed soon if we wanna if we wanna do the joint analysis. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. So the likelihood ploy in the end it doesn't have like a common uh, covariance matrix for all the probes. No, I thought it so. Had... Actually, ploy ploy will not have a covariance matrix. Mm. So ploy will read the covariance matrix as an external input. Okay. And then the IST nonlinear are working on on the one hand the spectroscopic covariance matrix together mm. with the science working group, and on the other hand on the three times two point covariance. But for the moment. Yeah. We don't really know how to combine these into yeah, yeah, yeah. single covariance, but, but yeah, I mean, exactly. This is something that needs to be done, but um, yeah. will come as an, an external file from to, for for Chloe. Okay. Okay. Any more questions, comments from the audience? Well, if not, let's thank Isaac again. Thank you again for this very nice talk. Thanks. Thanks again for the invitation, and, and sorry for for the small break at the middle.